Hi everyone, welcome back to the Trayline Podcast. I'm your host, Richard Boglin. Joining us today is Jared Tendler, um, and Jared is a high-level mental coach with clients in the field of golf, professional poker, and of course, trading. He's also the author of The Mental Game of Trading, which I really enjoyed listening to over the past few weeks. Um, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation, kind of completely different than all my other interviews. Uh, so Jared, thanks so much for being here. Welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks, Richard. Good to be here. Good to meet you. Sweet. Um, and to get get things started, I'd love to just hear about your background, um, how you became a mental coach in the first place, and yeah, just your overall journey. Yeah, I mean, it was, uh, I'd say not by choice, in the sense that I wanted to be, you know, like playing professional golf. That was my dream as a kid. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, I dreamed of being a professional athlete, right? So first it was right. tennis, you know, I was short. So golf kind of took over as an option. Um, and I got good very quickly through high school, uh, played in college, was a three-time All-American, you know, and, and was kind of continuing to like level up, uh, you know, pretty rapidly. But when I would go to try to qualify for the U.S. Open, the U.S. Amateur, big time national events, I was joking. I mean, there's sort of no way around it. Um, you know, pressure kind of eats at your weakest point. And for me, that was putting. And it's sort of, you know, it happens once. Okay, fine. It's a one-off happens again. And you're like, all right, well now, you know, there's a problem that needs to be solved. And so I dove into sports psychology, golf psychology. And for the most part, it helped my game. Right? I mean, I continued to play better. Like I said, I won nine times in college. And, but again, in those big, you know, moments, I was continuing to crumble. So there was like the kind of this gap between Sports psychology helps, but not when it matters most. So what the heck's the point? I mean, I can see value in it, but so I kind of reasoned that I was not alone, that there were other people like me who were struggling to kind of get over the hump that were, you know, kind of weeded out through, uh, you know, the competitive arenas. And it's like, if I could find a solution, then I would either solve my issues and have a chance at a career or I have a career as a, as a coach. And so uh, I uh, went to uh, get a master's degree in counseling psychology. Um, I chose that because I, I, for me, sports psychology was somewhat basic in that, uh, you know, if you were struggling with pressure, we were going to teach you to relax. If you were not confident, we're going to boost your confidence. If you're not motivated, we're going to find ways to inspire you. And it seemed kind of simple. And so if I can kind of combine that with the processes that therapists have to kind of get into the meat of issues and, and, and resolve yeah. deeper problems, then I'd have kind of this like kind of hybrid combination of skills and would be able to kind of provide a wide range. And, and that's eventually kind of what I did. So get, got my master's degree, got subsequently licensed as a therapist, never intended to practice. Uh, once I did that, I, I quit my job, uh, moved to Arizona and started, you know, kind of working, on, work, working with golfers and built up a roster of pretty decent junior golfers, amateur golfers, and some professionals, but really kind of had difficulty, you know, getting a lot of traction. And yeah, it was kind of surprising to me. I mean, golf, by by and large, people had always said golf is such a mental game, right. 90% mental. So it just intuitively made sense to me. All right, well, then we should be investing in this side of the game. And yet a lot of, you know, kind of golfers were not re yet ready to do that. And, and this was, you know, kind of on the heels of Tiger Woods basically saying like, hey, this is how dominant you can be when you have a, a mindset like that. So ironically, I met um, a, a poker player on the golf course who used to be a professional player. A golfer and he kind of introduced this world of online poker you know which at that point was beginning to kind of take off with poker stars and full tilt poker and um you know he was playing um many tables at once so mm -hmm. we're talking like between 12 and 15 tables at once about a thousand hands an hour wow and he was making about a dollar a hand which doesn't sound like much but you know you add it up and over the course of a of a year he was making about a million dollars um and actually i should say that was kind of after we he and i started working together, uh, what, what he found was that um, he was tilting, right? The, mm -hmm. the, the, the variance was so maddening to his mind uh, that he was quite literally like grabbing his mouse, smashing his, his monitor, you know, ripping the desktop out of the wall. And, and so there was just a, a pile of, of broken computer equipment when I first met him in the corner of his room. And, and at that point, he was um, playing fewer tables, and, and, and a less amount of time right. because the tilt was just disrupting his, his rhythm. So four to six months later, he's making, you know, $150,000 a month playing a lot more. And he introduces me to, uh, you know, these online poker training sites, which are, had kind of just popped up. And so that, you know, led me to have a huge uh, kind of roster of clients. I then write the mental game of poker, which came out in 2011. Um, and then around 2013, 
I released the mental game of poker too, which was kind of more about the zone and, mm -hmm. and more kind of advanced concepts. But around that same time, traders started picking up the poker book right. and I started getting feedback. Like, you know, look, you change the word poker to trading and you've got yourself another book, all the concepts apply. Um, and so, yeah, I just started working with some, some, some traders, uh, more, mostly retail, and then started getting some institutional gigs. Um, NDA prevents me from saying whom, but you know, we're talking, uh, very large scale, uh, operations making uh, a lot of money. Um, and so, you know, just kind of continue to build up a uh, roster of clients, you know, understanding the nuances of trading, how, yeah, poker and trading are similar, but there are some very distinct differences. Right. Um, the issues may be the same but there's uh, different ways that traders talk about things. You know, greed is not really something that's talked about in, in poker. Um, you know, tilt was kind of the big thing, you know, anger issues was the big thing. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of differences culturally amongst traders as poker players. And, and about three years ago, I, I know, I guess three and a half years ago, started working on the mental game of trading it took me about three years. And, and so here we are. Perfect. And I'd love to hear kind of your take on, the commonalities in terms of um, issues and mistakes that people run into across golf, across poker, across trading, uh, because like you said, there are so, are some things that every every that all those disciplines share. But I'm sure there's differences as well. Yeah, I mean, I think when we look at you know the issues of let's say fear or anger, confidence issues, discipline issues, motivational issues, I mean, they exist across. All. I mean, we're at, at we're we're people first, and we're you know kind of athletes poker players, traders second. Right. So, you know, there's not that much variety down below, but when, when we look kind of at the surface, right. I, I think golfers significantly underestimate the impact of luck in the game. <laughs> and so there, there is a lot of anger issues in golf that I think is sort of kind of more related to entitlement, right? They think that they're better than they are because you know, if you look at the handicap system in golf, you, you actually toss out the bottom 10 scores. And so your handicap's kind of an average of your best 10. Mm -hmm. I mean, imagine if traders, you, you if that, if your, if your PL was like that, yeah. right. I mean, so, you know, golf is, I mean, we're talking slightly differently around, you know, the professional ranks and, and the elite amateurs, but, you know, by and large golfers are, are, are more entitled uh, and they, that results to with, with some confidence and, and anger issues. You know, poker players and traders, I mean, you all have to be experts at dealing with uncertainty, right? There's right. far more, you know, gray, uh, especially in terms of your competency, in terms of the, the validity of your results in the short term. And so it requires a, a degree of, I think, kind of mental fortitude that is unlike most competitive arenas where you're you're actually going to never know exactly what your true wrench is. You know, I mean, like by the time you find out, it's already changed and the market's changed. So, you know, yeah, we can back test and we can get close, but you're never going to have, you know, kind of pinpoint accuracy like, you know, professionals are certainly in other sports like, I mean, chess. I mean, chess is almost, you know, kind of the most um, egalitarian uh, system in that regard. I'm getting that word right. But, um, you know, so the, the, the necessity to deal with that uncertainty, I think, can drive poker players and traders mad. Uh, you know, especially when the results in the short term are going against you, it's incredibly difficult and it causes all of the, the range of emotions that I've talked about. Um, I, I'd say FOMO is far bigger of an issue in trading than it is in poker. Yeah. You know, the FOMO in poker is more of like, oh man, I wish I could play in that event or I wish I could play in that, you know, really soft table that these guys have been able to play in. Um, you know, I, I think that the time frame with which decisions are made, right, you, you know, you talk about sort of the day traders, the swing traders. You know, sometimes you're only making, quote unquote, like three or four trades, you know, per day or per week. Now, I would argue that you're making hundreds of decisions a day by right. not actually executing trades or by seeing what the market's doing. But by and large, you know, poker players and golfers, I mean, they are actively kind of doing things on a more regular basis, which means that the feedback loop sometimes can be a lot tighter. Right. You know, for the, the poker player I was talking about who's playing a thousand hands an hour, I mean, he's effectively playing like a 72 hole PGA Tour event every single day. Right. And for some traders, he's playing the equivalent of, you know, a month's worth of results. So, yeah, there's a lot of uncertainty kind of taken out of the results when you have high volume like that. Um, so, you know, that that's a benefit. But at the same time, right, there's obviously kind of diminished quality and execution. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the decision making process can can degrade in different ways just because of the volume. So, you know, I, I think what's cool for me about uh, poker and trading is like kind of your technique, your asset 
is your decision-making process. And to me, that's equivalent to the golfer's golf swing. And both poker players, and I, I, hopefully this will start to change more and more with, with, with traders now, really need to be thinking about your decision-making process as a technique, as something you need to, need to be training and honing. And that's different from your knowledge base, right? You know, you can look at any decision you make as a trader and analyze where it gets wrong, where the biases start to creep in, uh, under what conditions is it going to break down? And if you do that, um, yes, right. Well, you can obviously look at the mistakes as being a result of it. Sometimes you're gonna, you're not gonna, It's not the PL that that's going to reflect it because you obviously can make, you know, poor choices or even slightly marginal choices and get rewarded for it. But it's really, do you understand how you make your best decisions? And if you treat that like a technique that you need to train and analyze on a consistent basis, it does help to take away some of that uncertainty in the short term, which, you know, automatically, right? If you take away the uncertainty, some of the uncertainty, you become more emotionally stable. Absolutely. And I want to dive a little bit deeper into FOMO because I think that's such an important topic that so many people experience, especially when everybody's on Twitter, everybody's seeing somebody post that this stock's up 10%, this stock's up 20%. So I'd love to hear your take on kind of the root causes of FOMO and also some techniques traders can use to kind of mitigate it. Yeah. So FOMO, uh, I would put in the category uh, of greed, yeah. which is that they're kind of umbrella terms that when you look a lot more closely at the mental or emotional factors driving those reactions, mm -hmm. that they're, they're not anything that's super unique to it. So sticking with FOMO, right? Sometimes FOMO is driven by actual fear, right? It, it's fears in the term, but, but what are you really fearing, right? Are you fearing missing an opportunity? In which case then the flaw associated with that is thinking, that you're never going to get another opportunity like this one. This is a once in a lifetime. And for some traders, right, logically, that sounds absurd because right. logically, you know that there will be more opportunities. But in the moment, you are raptured by this idea that you have to capture this one now. Otherwise, right. that ship is sailed and it's gone. And, and of course, logic and emotion, when that gap exists, that's what produces these kind of uncontrolled decisions. And so so that's, that's one example. Um, another one would be, uh, it's some, it can be kind of anger driven, mm -hmm. which sounds strange on the surface, but really the anger is in response to what would happen if you miss out on the opportunity. So it's not necessarily this trade that you're worried about. It's that you're going to get pissed off because you're going to see other people making money and you're not. That could be related to jealousy. It could be related to some confidence issues, right? Seeing, oh, well, they must be better than me. Um, it, it can you know uh, be related to the the anger that's associated with the violations of your own discipline and rules, right? So when we start to peel back the layers, right? Perfectionism can be in here, right? Some traders feel like they have to capture every opportunity. If they don't, that violates kind of their, the, the sense of their own competency and control. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what, what I would what I would suggest for, for those that are watching or listening, um, look at the instances when you experience FOMO and, and try to write down specifically like what's going through your mind. What are you feeling in the moment, right? Try to kind of capture the mental and emotional data. Uh, you know, as you've kind of gotten through the book, right? The, the early chapters are really dedicated towards this idea of kind of mapping each of your, your problems. Right. And when you start to understand that your pattern of FOMO, your pattern of tilt, your pattern of fear, they happen in repetitive ways and, and, con and consistent ways. Now, not always exactly the same way, but if you can capture what's going through your mind, how your decision-making process changes, how your perception of the opportunity or perception of the market changes, any physical signs, right? Like, you know, do you kind of hyper-focus on one chart, you know, and, and, and to kind of to the exclusion of others, um, you know, do you feel like kind of tension in your hand or heat in your head? Uh, do your you know, feet kind of tap? You're, you're just trying to capture all of that data mm -hmm. because then when you see it again in the future, that should give you a clue that the feeling that you have is not being driven by logic. It's being driven by something that is flawed. Now, figuring out what that flaw is, is sort of the next step of the puzzle. But right. if you can't see what is happening in real time, right? If you can't call out the fact that you are believing that this is a good opportunity, not because it actually is, but because of FOMO, you, know, you have no chance of actually stopping those mistakes from occurring. And it's one thing to kind of be somewhat aware in the moment, and it's another thing to be 
aware enough that you can actually stop yourself and do something different. Um, and that takes a, a more kind of clear, uh, more clear details about what's going on. So, so taking detailed notes kind of throughout the day when you're starting to feel these emotions creep up, um, that, that helps over time. You kind of analyze yourself in real time so you can kind of avoid the mistakes that you make as a result of those emotions. Exactly. Yeah. So I would say take notes during the trading session, um, review them after, Yeah. consolidate them, um, you know, review them before you trade, especially if it's, you know, if you don't have too many issues, you know, uh, there's no downside to preparing yourself ahead of time. Right. Say, look out for these warning signs, because right. if they come, then you've got to take a step back, go for a walk, clear your mind and really make sure that you're you're thinking logically. And then as you kind of get do this kind of day over day, after doing it for about a week or two, assuming that it's sort of normal trading conditions for you or, you know, if a swing trader, you know, maybe you know, like four to six weeks, right. you're going to start to see some very clear patterns. Right. And then you want to kind of consolidate it into one kind of roadmap of, all right, when FOMO is at level one, right, very, very kind of minor, here's what it looks like. When it's at level three, here's what it looks like. Because the thing that we're dealing with, and this is, I'd say something that every person listening needs to tattoo to the inside of their brain. We're dealing with a, an emotional system that has the power to shut down higher brain function, mm -hmm. right? So when your emotions start to pick up steam, proportionally, you lose access to thinking, to planning, and actually emotional control. Yeah. And this is the real kind of you know, uh, thing that'll make your head scramble. The part of the brain responsible for emotional control can be shut down by your emotions. Right. So this is not something that any of us have control of. This is hardwiring that's been around, right? People talk about kind of the reptilian brain, like this is what we're talking about. Fight or flight mechanism, this is what we're talking about. The way around that, right, is to look at the early warning signs, right? When the emotion is still small, right? The, 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 uh, the signs are there that if this is unchecked, if uh, you have another couple of losses, or if you see a couple other people, you know, having good results, but right. the emotion is going to keep cre uh, creeping up and then the inevitable is going to happen, right? You're going to fire off maybe a lot larger than you should, uh, you know, a trade in a position that you shouldn't be in. And that inevitability, right, is well-worn. The pattern is there. That is what you are actually good at. You've been practicing making those FOMO type trades for a long time. So to think that just being aware in the moment, like this one time you're going to stop yourself just because magically you're going to wake up and realize that it was dumb is not going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think there's a, there's a gap between that awareness of what's going on and the understanding of the work that's needed in order to prepare yourself to do something different in those key moments, right? For me, going back to my golf, right? I had to understand that my own version of perfectionism was creeping up in these moments. I didn't fully even appreciate the legitimacy and the, and the understanding that, that fear at low levels is immaterial, right? Mm -hmm. Under pressure conditions, your body is going to feel different. And it's, it's just simply a distraction, right? If I told you to focus on how your feet feel or how your butt feels in that chair right now, while you continue to listen to what I'm saying, Right. You have this sort of interface, this interference where you're kind of shifting gears between that sensory input between my voice and your butt. And and that's a, just a distraction. Fear does the same thing. It drives your focus internally. I didn't know that. Right. I didn't have people that really could kind of educate me and took me under my wing around what is it like to compete under pressure. Right. Once I learned that, I mean, I have a very vivid memory of playing in a, another kind of big qualifier on the first hole, I had a four foot putt for par. I made like a really good bunker shot to get there. My hands were visibly shaking. And I backed off and I said, doesn't matter. I can still make this putt. And I drilled it right in the hole with my hand shaking. You know, so there's sort of these kind of misperceptions that, you know, if you're not aware of, right, mm -hmm. then they're going to cause problems. So I know I've talked to, you know, in a lot of kind of angles here, but to summarize, right, it's you got to get prepared by understanding your pattern. You got to understand how to disrupt that pattern. And you've got to catch it early because if you don't, your emotions are going to steamroll you, steamroll you, and you're going to make the same mistakes that you've made time and time again. Absolutely, absolutely. And yeah, I was actually talking to um, Anne Marie Band, who is a, a trader and a, and a former neuroscience researcher, and she was talking about how cortisol 
impacts everything and in short circuits the the high level thinking so that, that lines up exactly with what you were saying um and uh one more thing i wanted to talk to you about was um basically uh the the inchworm concept in your book I, i'd love to hear your take on that and if you could explain to, to people who maybe hadn't read your book which i recommend checking it out there'll be a link down below in the description but if if somebody hasn't read your book could you talk about that because i think it's really really interesting cool yeah, I mean, it's honestly what's one of my favorite things. So I'm yeah. glad you brought it up. Um, so the inchworm concept is actually based on an actual inchworm. And so for those that don't know, like an inchworm is like a, a tiny little caterpillar that moves like this, right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, the front end of it kind of stems fo- steps forward and then the kind of the back foot, which is kind of anchoring it, then kind of does this like slinky action and moves forward. So if you think about um, your game, right, your 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 performance as a trader, we can segment it into A game, B game, and C game, right? You at your best, you at your worst, and then an average. And the way that improvement happens over time is the way that an inchworm moves, right? So your A game gets better, Mm -hmm. but if if that's the only thing you're working on, if you're only kind of working on like kind of mastering like your best, um, uh, you know, sort of system trades, right? And you're not really working on the back end, right? The C game where your execution of that system is off because of FOMO, because of greed, because of anger. If you're not working on that part, eventually that front end gets stretched out mm-hmm. and, and it, you, you create what I call a wide range, right? Where the gap between your very best and your very worst becomes too wide. And for a lot of traders, a lot of poker players, a lot of golfers, this is a very, very simple yet basic cause of a lot of emotional volatility. And you wouldn't think that, but what happens is the space between your very best and your very worst defines everything that you're currently learning. Mm -hmm. All of our default mode right now, like what we could do just completely brain dead, just exhausted, burned out or mindlessly tilted, right? That is kind of our base level of skill. And so for the more seasoned traders out there, there's a degree to which you can never make trading decisions as basic as you did a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, regardless of, of the conditions, right? And so that mm-hmm. kind of creates this sort of proverbial like stop loss to how much your 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 execution can degrade. Right. Right. Newer traders haven't quite got to that point yet, but it'll it'll come as you continue to work. And so from that point where we we call this sort of all the automated decisions, actions, right? That's kind of the very back end of your interim. The very front end sort of defines like the newest things that have come up, like the intuitions, the the elaborations to your system, the things that you've sort of seen that Maybe you, you can't even kind of fully comprehend and yet, yet you're able to trade on when you're in a good space. So everything in between there, you're currently learning. Now, what happens is, right, when that gap is too wide, it's very, very energy intensive to be at your best. So you're not going to be there very often. And when you start to slip, you're going to slip hard, right? Because your emotions are going to creep up very, very rapidly. It's going to cause you to burn out more often. So if you're constantly exhausted at the end of a trading day, it could be because your range is too wide and what you need to be focusing on is more of that back end C game improvement. Don't learn anything new, right? Don't try to adapt your systems. Try to nail the consistency of your, uh, of your system a lot more. When we look at the best traders in the world, the best poker players in the world, the best golfers in the world, we can say unequivocally that their C games are head and shoulders above the C games of everybody else. Right. It doesn't mean that their A games are necessarily that much more evolved or advanced. Certainly within professional golf ranks, you know, Tiger Woods in his heyday, um, you know, his his A game, maybe at best we could say was like a tenth of a shot per round better than everybody else's. Everybody else is playing out of their minds. Um, you know, the edges were not that large. Yeah. But I, I mean, I, I'm estimating here. Tiger might have been two or three shots better per round when he was in his C game and everybody else was in their C game, he right. made cuts that nobody else would make. And so you look at like, what's, what does that mean for traders? It means you're not the cause of your trading mistakes, right? That if your C game is a lot narrower, then sometimes the trading mistakes are more due to the market conditions have changed. There's some kind of outdated elements of your system or strategy that don't perfectly align with current market conditions and sort of need to be upgraded mm-hmm. or just, are outdated in general. You've learned some new things. So if you learn something new, by definition, the old stuff is outdated. It's like a piece of software. Mm-hmm. And so that that constant movement of the back sometimes is just very basic. For most people that show up on my door, and most people that 
you know, will get the most out of the mental game of trading, they have the issues of FOMO and anger and confidence issues. And that is kind of the thing that's holding their C game back, right? That's what's holding their inchworm back. So, you know, I guess to get, to get started, right. I would, I would ask yourself two questions. One is how wide is that gap between my best and my worst? And if that gap is wide, stop learning new stuff and focus on that back end improvement. And then to focus on that back end improvement, I would ask one question, ask yourself, what is holding you back? And if you don't have a good answer for that question, then make it something that you're regularly asking yourself every day. Maybe the start of the day, the end of the day, what held me back today? What could hold me back today? You ask that question, all of a sudden things are going to start to emerge and you're going to see some of the problems that you may not have been aware of before. And that will guide you to the work that needs to get done to kind of unstick that back end so that inchworm can kind of keep moving again. I love that. And it actually lines up very nicely with kind of what we teach at TraderLine, where we've got, um, we kind of help people understand what phase of trading they're in. Are they in the consistency phase where they're trying to just nail down a system, learn risk management, learn proper position sizing, kind of work on the fundamentals and just improve that back end, that C game over and over again? Or have they done that long enough where then they can move into the performance phase where they can use a little bit more intu intuition and, and build on, on that base, but that base is always there and it's always going to protect you. Make sure you're, you're never going to go too off the rails and take too heavy a loss because you've mastered that particular um, base level of fundamentals, if that makes sense. It does. Yeah, that's great. And um, I would say to the newer traders, if you're having kind of mental and emotional issues in the just the learning of those fundamentals, yeah. look for where they exist in your personal life. Right. Mm -hmm. You don't yet have enough skill and competency in trading to have kind of the quote unquote, like typical trading performance problems yet. Right. They're more often going to be related to. So like an illusion of control, a hatred of mistakes, a hatred of losing. Does it show up elsewhere in your life? Because if it does, then you can kind of cross train and work on it in multiple places. And if you mm -hmm. do that, then you're going to learn those fundamentals a lot faster. Um, but I'm really happy that you're not uh, encouraging intuition amongst yeah. newer traders because I think that's a common misconception too. You need a base of competency for intuition to thrive. So that's great. Yeah, a, a solid structure of risk management position sizing is essential for any system as the base. Um, and yeah, we really encourage selling into strength, just nailing down some profits early, moving your stops up, all of that, which is super important. Um, I'd also love to talk with you, Jared, about something that every trader has experienced. I talked about about this with you before we press record, but uh, dealing with losses, because everybody everybody has gone through that uh, period where they're taking a loss after a loss. Maybe there there's an earnings gap down, that type of thing. So I'd love to hear um, kind of you talk about the emotions that go go along with dealing with a loss, and also ways that people can settle their mind and, and get back on the right right track when they do suffer a really big setback so it doesn't um, impede their future growth as a trader. Yeah. So I mean, we're talking about maybe kind of a few things, right? So you've yeah. got the like big, you know, kind of drawdowns where, yeah. you know, you lose control and all of a sudden you, you know, kind of wipe 30% out of your account. And now you're really dealing with, you know, a heavy loss that's going to take some time to, to recover from. Um, I would kind of differentiate that from kind of the day-to-day -day losses and even right, you know, right. kind of like a standard drawdown in the standard drawdown kind of phase or, or, you know, kind of situation, you know, there we're dealing with, okay, like, again, what is at the root of why it is that you're hating these, these losses. Right. Sometimes it's very simply because you hate losing. And I mean, for those that hate losing, it's kind of inconceivable why anybody would not to hate losing. You know, but there are some people who kind of have learned to accept that it is a fundamental kind of component to the game. And if you are kind of raging against it, then you're only going to cause more problems. And so for those people who may never actually kind of embrace or accept that reality, that's OK. But the question becomes, like, what do you do next? Right. Are you making mistakes trying to make up for losses? And if you're doing that, then I would argue that there is a flaw in your logic, in your perception at that point. And sometimes it's it's. A, maybe like a, a, um, a failure to appreciate how strong you actually are. Right? I actually had a trader this morning who was talking about with this issue. And what he commented on was, it's really just kind of in the moment that he feels the pain. When he, when he actually closes out the trade and closes out for a loss, he's fine. Like, it, you know, I'm, not, I'm not saying he feels happy, yeah. but it's like, oh, I, I can move on and I can begin thinking about you know, the next opportunity. It's just in the heat of the moment when you know, the PO hasn't been closed out yet, right? It's it's unrealized. There's still maybe hope. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's still something I can do. Maybe I can add to it. And I can manufacture something. 
And, and it's kind of in that where the chaos lives. And if you understand that you're strong enough to take the punch, then it's okay to close out and understand that you want to preserve the capital for the next opportunity. So like, that's one example. Um, sometimes the losses kind of pings your confidence. So I'd say this is kind of maybe more true with the traders kind of, that are kind of in that like intermediate phase where they're not a beginner, right. but they're not advanced enough where they're making it in a, a like a full-time way. That's like, yes, this is, right. you know, kind of uh, like we're off and running where, where their confidence gets, gets dinged a little bit, that the losses start to eat at their belief that they can make it. Now they start thinking about all those people that question their decision to do this. Like, what were you thinking? And then those thoughts start to come to mind. And so then either, you know, in reaction to those thoughts or just instinctively you fire off another trade trying to make back because you're really trying to make back confidence. It's not about the loss of capital. It's the loss of emotional, you know, kind of strength in a sense. Yeah. And that's what you're fighting back for. So again, much like with FOMO, you really need to be taking notes down around the loss. Like what is going through your mind? Because it can be related to a few different things, right? Um, it's sometimes it's related to, to fear, right? The fear of, of, of failing, right? Like you take sequential losses and see the drawdown coming. Some people get into this sort of, um, uh, what I call a shitty psychic, where you start thinking about the future, and and that's not there's nothing wrong about thinking about the future. I mean, our minds are capable of projection, and we mm -hmm. need to use that on a regular basis. The problem is that you believe your projection is real, right? And and I would argue that you know in that space where you feel really bad about losses and you're projecting more losses, you're actually overconfident. And it's a really strange thing to hear or say, but the overconfidence is the belief that you are correct, that more losses are going to happen. Mm -hmm. And the flip side happens, you know, when <laughs> you're, you're on, a, on a rush and making a ton and you predict that more wins are going to come, or you predict that you're going to close out this monster trade that, you know, it, it, in five minutes, it's gone 80% to your target. Well, then of course it's going to Forex. And so, you know, that projection feels real. Right. But it's not because you're not a psychic. If you were, you wouldn't be watching this right now. So yeah. understanding that that's kind of what's causing the excessive despair or fear is that projection. You can kind of start to dial it back. But again, figure out kind of what's going through your mind. You know, you start breaking it down in the instances where you have these massive kind of outsized losses. The problem that I'd say traders end up dealing with most there is a trying to make it back too quickly. Right. Yeah. Revenge. And so yeah. you kind of have to be like an injured athlete, right? You just destroyed your ankle. Are you going to go back out and start running again? Mentally, we feel like we can. Right. And so what we risk there is actually making things a lot worse, much like that athlete. Right. And so I, I, I even suggest this to, to traders after they've had very big winning days or winning months that are kind of outsized for their own, um, uh, you know, what they're used to, like, right. take a day. I mean, as traders, it's so easy to feel like you have to be there all the time because that's your job. Right. Let me make it very, very clear. You are a performer. You're an athlete. You get paid based on your performance. You are not a nine to five employee with a punch card checking in, clocking in day and, and, and then clocking out. So just showing up is not good enough. You have to show up with a high potential of being at your best. And if you can't do that, that's fine, especially on those days where you have big outsized losses or big outsized winners. If you just take a day to kind of absorb what happened, right, the emotions will start to subside. You'll wake up, you know, a day or two later feeling better and feel and, and you preserve a lot of emotional capital, a lot of confidence, right, by doing that rather than just jumping in. And then what happens? I mean, you see it all the time, right? Big outsized losses. Another, you know, and you have a, you follow up with another one, right. big outsized winners. You give back a third within a week. Like, come on. I mean, it's, it's so common. So just think of yourself like a performer and do what, you know, what you would, what you would do. Like, I mean, any, it's, it's so rare that you'd see a PGA tour player um, play another tournament right after winning a major. Right. And if they do, I, I actually, I have to go back and see, I haven't seen anybody win after that because it's so emotionally draining to win a major in golf right so for you yes even though it feels really good that you just 
maybe, uh, you know, made 30% on your account today because this massive winner, cool, absorb it, take it, take some time to let it absorb. So uh, yeah, I mean, I've given a, a fair amount of advice there, but uh, around the losses, I think the other piece is um, sometimes it really stings and sticks with you. Yeah. And, and I talk to traders who, you know, a year later, they're still lamenting these big losses and how could I have been so stupid? And, and it becomes very much of a, of a shameful, self-critical, judgmental, negative thing. And it doesn't help, right? Mm-hmm. You need to understand why the big loss happened. And if you figure out why it happened, sometimes it's related to overconfidence because you just made a ton. Sometimes it's related to FOMO and jealousy, but you, it, it, it's never random. And mm-hmm. if you don't figure out why it happened, then you're not going to be able to prevent the next one from happening. And, you know, you eventually you can lose a bunch of confidence in yourself long term if you if you don't kind of get to the root of that stuff. Absolutely. And I think I think it's part of becoming a professional trader or having that professional trading mindset to accept losses that it's going to happen, um, not to cross into your domain with poker, but it's like it's like paying the ante that that's that's the price you pay to be involved in a trade is potentially get that stop loss hit. So, uh, yeah, I think that's excellent. And um, I want to ask you about kind of habits and um, techniques people can use outside of trading, uh, whether it's sleeping, staying fit, um, that you would kind of recommend to stay on top of your mental game as much as possible. So uh, when that bell rings at 930 Eastern, you're ready to go out there and perform. Yeah, I mean, I, I, again, I, I, I would use that kind of construct of, of an athlete yeah. in mind, right? And so you just sort of look at, you know, how intensively do you want to take this thing? You know, mm-hmm. do you want to be you know, the LeBrons and the Tigers and the elites of the world. And, and if you do, what that means is that uh, everything in your life revolves around trading and that's okay. You know, it doesn't mean that your, your family or your friends are, are like kind of less of a priority, right? They're always most important if something were to happen, mm-hmm. right? But in the short term, right? And the short term could be years. Uh, trading is, is how you make all of your personal decisions, right? So, um, you know, are you going out on the, on the weekends? In what way? Um, what, what are you doing in the morning in terms of fitness and diet? Mm-hmm. I mean, you can take this as kind of deep as you want. And there's a lot of material out there around that. So I, I think the biggest problem that traders get into is trying to do too much too fast. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, here we are kind of at the end of the year. And I would look back, right, reflect on the year and see what, what in what ways did you make progress? Now, you know, being in a pandemic environment, right? Sometimes that has led to things happening in two directions. One, right, our our routines have gotten kind of wildly off. Yeah. Right. Others have been able to kind of use it to strengthen their routines. Either way, it doesn't matter. You are here, so just look at where you are. Mm-hmm. Maybe look at how you got here, and then start looking at 2022 and saying, what are you know one or two things in Q1 that I can do to strengthen my habits and my routines? Mm -hmm. Is it wake up at a consistent time, have a consistent, diligent process for how my my prep goes? Do I need to work out before that? I mean, I would say that the most important, easiest thing to do as a trader is to spend two to five minutes a day at the end of your trading sessions, like kind of either going over your notes about what you took uh, or what happened mentally, emotionally, or writing them down. It's, it's crazy how easy it is to do. And yet so few end up doing it because they don't, or they're not kind of dedicated to it and they don't feel the value. But a, a majority of my clients who I've kind of convinced to do this always say, man, like I just didn't get it at first. Yeah. Now I see why it's so valuable. And here's why it's so valuable because right. The thing about the emotions is they're very fluid, right? Like the things that cause you anger today are going to cause maybe like the same amount of anger six months from now, Mm -hmm. but your progression might be significant, but that, that, the feeling of anger towards a loss might be exactly the same. And yet your actions afterwards are wildly different. Your ability to recover from it are wildly different. And so if you're not taking notes about your own kind of mental and emotional progress or what's happening, you lose kind of a paper trail to measure your own improvement and see that progression. It's not like your PL where you can just click a button and have you know your graph there, see what's right. going on. So so that that's a I think a very important thing to do um, on, a, on a daily basis. You know, but then again, like what other habits and activities are you doing? Just look for one or two. I think the biggest mistake is trying to do too much too quickly. Yeah. And you know, especially with the New Year's resolutions kind of mentality, 
which is really all about inspiration, right? It's, it's just this like intense fuel that says, now I'm going to be perfect. And what happens, right? Your A game on your, on your discipline inchworm gets stretched out here. And why do resolutions fail? Because you still got a C game, right? Your C game becomes the gravitational force that come March or April or after a vacation or after a drawdown, you inevitably sink back down into your prior habits. So focus on things that are going to move that back end forward in your that. discipline. Don't necessarily, you know, just like be driving towards improved A game discipline. You know, it's C game discipline in my mind is more important if you've got a big kind of variation between those two points. And your C game, you can almost impact that more. You, you can affect your C game a little bit better than your A game because the A game is a, a lot of intuition, the highest level stuff, while the C game might be more fundamental based things that you can work on right now and try to get better at. Yeah, I mean, I, yes. Um, the, the difficulty is when there are things that are like a me mental and emotional that are part of that like right. kind of paralysis yeah, back there. Absolutely. If you don't have that, then you hundred percent, if you do have that, then your job is to figure out what's blocking you. So, you know, for a lot of people who are dealing with discipline, what you'll notice in the mental game of trading is discipline is chapter eight. It's very much at the end of the book. Why? Because a major majority of traders think they have discipline issues when they actually have emotional issues. Right. And so we need to clear out the greed and the tilt and the fear and the confidence issues that force you to violate your system strategy or force you to mess up your routines kind of around trading. That's where the bigger problems lie, right? The, mm -hmm. Like the procrastination, right? Well, why does, why does procrastination take hold? Because you believe that tomorrow exists, right? And, and I know that sounds a little weird, but you believe that tomorrow will be exactly like today. Well, guess what? If you've wasted a day, you know, effectively training your bad habits, it takes you two days to get back to where you could have been had you done it right the first time. So for example, if you've decided that you're going to, you know, do a workout, you know, before you trade. And then today you're like, nah, I don't need it. Right. So now it's going to take you two days to recover from the one day you missed and the one day you did it poorly. Mm -hmm. So tomorrow is a fantasy in the minds of procrastinators. Tomorrow you have more responsibility if you pushed it to tomorrow. So point being, right? Understand the things that are kind of holding back that C game uh, in terms of your discipline and, and then do the work to, to fix it. And I'll kind of end with uh, sometimes it's as simple as sucking less, right? C game is not fun, but your job is not to be in your A game. Your job is not to be perfect all the time. That's not possible. In those instances where C game is likely, if you just have a little bit of suck less, it actually could go a, lot, uh, go a long way. For sure. And um, Jared, I wanted to ask you about kind of getting into the tilt part of thing, because there's such a wide range of emotions that traders go through from euphoria when, you know, your stocks are all going up versus the heavy losses and, and that fear, feeling of frustration, despair, anger. So I'd love to talk about um, kind of, I guess, techniques and methods you can use to stay centered and, and not, not experience such a wide range of emotions. So the cool thing in my mind about my system is that the system is sort of emotionally agnostic, right? So, mm -hmm. right. You've got to go through and you've got to map your pattern of anger, just like FOMO. You've got to go through and break down and understand the root cause of that anger. Mm -hmm. And once you've done that, you devise what I call injecting logic statements. And it's really just thinking, but it's thinking on steroids because the problem is that traders have an idea of the logic that they should be thinking in these key moments. But what happens the emotion steamrolls it. Yeah. So if you train that logic and, and prepare it and make it, and you apply it early, right? That's where the technique of injecting logic comes in, is in kind of all of those facets. Then it has the power to kind of fight back against that tilt in that moment, right? And, and in some cases it actually can reconcile, right? Like you can, you catch it early, you have a good understanding of the cause, inject that logic, right? So for example, let's say it's a, it's a hatred of mistakes. And so for you, missing out on a trade feels like a mistake. Right. And so, you know, you say to yourself, um, all right, I know that I can't capture every trade, but the bigger mistake would be violating my system and going against my rules. So take the hit and don't make a second mistake. Right. And again, not like rocket science here, not like 
you know, shouldn't be of like a big aha for some traders who have this problem. But the key is that you're writing it down, you're training it, meaning like you're reviewing it daily, perhaps several times throughout the trading day. Maybe you've got a sticky note on your computer, right? One of your monitors, right? You train that logic. And then you also have what I call a strategic reminder. Mm -hmm. So that can be a multiple, uh, you know, multitude of things. But for the most part, it's like, okay, you get yourself mentally and emotionally stable. It doesn't always guarantee that you're going to still make a good trading decision. So there you might be reminding yourself of the common mistakes you're going to try to avoid, or you're going to write down the things in your decision-making process that maybe you, you forget about or, or ignore, right? So for example, you know, maybe there's a, a particular um, signal or a, a, a tool that you use on a regular basis, but then forget to do when you make mistakes. So you're, mm-hmm. it's, it's going to be like in your face saying, don't forget X, right? Or if you want to be really aggressive, you write down your entire decision-making process. You have a very, I mean, I, I've, some of my clients have like a, almost like a page long checklist yeah. of every element that they need to be able to kind of sign off on to make a trade. And, and in a way it almost becomes like an airline pilot doing a lap around the airplane right before they fly. It's like, you know, are we go, no, go for fly here? Are we go, no, go for this trade here? If not all of these things are checked off. And again, you can have it mentally, mm-hmm. but if you have it mentally at a time when the emotions are compromising it, like it's going to get fuzzy right. and you're kind of gambling in my mind. So at those times you do need to be more regimented and systematized so that you can prevent yourself from making mistakes. So again, it's right. Map the pattern of tilt. Right. Uh, understand the root cause of it, come up with an injecting logic statement, a strategic reminder, and rinse, repeat until right, you solve the problem. And that, that does end up happening. Right, You can get to the point where tilt, fear, confidence issues become deactivated because you've actually fixed the cause of the problem. Right, You're never going to remove emotion from the equation. Right, yeah. Emotions are not the problem. We're not treating emotion you know, as, as like the enemy here, we're treating emotion as a signal, as part of this kind of cluster of issues that are occurring in these key moments. So, you know, again, it, the, the system is, is that clean. And I've actually, um, I should go live on Tuesday next week, put together kind of a cheat sheet, mm-hmm. uh, for my system. So it's just a bit easier for people to kind of follow. Cause I, I do know that it's, you know, the book kind of takes you through it, but, uh, you know, having a cheat sheet never hurt, never hurts. Right. For sure. And I'd love to hear about, um, cause obviously with poker and, and trading money is on the line for the most part. So how, how does the attachment to money and, and the value of money, um, I guess, compound and affect all the emotions that we go through when we have to make all these decisions and, and perform at a high level? Yeah. I mean, I think everybody kind of has their, uh, their limit to where you can sort of treat the money as being just a number. Right. being like a scorecard, you know, being all about the percentage and the P&L and not about the actual monetary value and the utility of it. But at a certain point, right, that that could be, you know, quite noteworthy, especially as you're, you know, maybe getting closer to reaching your goals of making 10 to 15K per month. So now you can right. quit your job and and make this a full-time gig, right? You're, you're making five to 6K a month. All of a sudden it's like, well, crap, that's like my mortgage and my car payment and, you know, maybe some vacation money. Like all of a sudden like that, starts to become kind of tangible. And, and so, you know, it's not, to me, the goal was not about desensitization of that, emo, right. Of the, of that attack. You don't want to detach yourself from the money. What you want to do is firmly attach yourself, right. To the things that you're trying to control. And in the short term, it's not the money, right. And there's a tool I use. It's, it's in um, chapter three of the book, right. After the interim concept called the A to C game analysis. And the A to C game analysis is similar to the kind of the mapping of a, of a pro- problem. But what it does is, right, it firmly describes your A game, B game, and C game. And when you do that, you give yourself the ability to kind of grade yourself on a, on a trade-by-trade or day-by-day basis in terms of how you perform. Yeah. And, and that's really important for traders and poker players in dealing with that uncertainty. Because when you see that you had, you know, a wildly green day, but it turns out actually you made a bunch of mistakes you ought to feel very differently about that than when you lost a lot of money, but it was sort of an A-game day for you. Right, right. So your attachment to execution, to skill, to improvement, you know, becomes a buffer against an over-attachment to results and P&L in the short term. And, and what that does is kind of diversifies kind of your the, the, the 
the ways in which you emotionally react to a trade. So you can have the damn it, like I lost, you know, 2K or, you know, a percent, but, you know, here's what I saw in my performance. Yep. Good job. Or no, actually I learned something here. So cool. I'll use that and make myself better or, you know, vice versa. So, you know, I, I think when we're, when we're dealing with that, like kind of over attachment uh, to results or to money, you know, that's certainly part of it. Or we start to dig into the, all right, well, maybe it's related to your longer term goals. So you're really attached to making PL today because again, you need that feeling like you're making progress. If you have the third loss in a row, well, now it's going to feel like your goals are at risk. You're going to fail and all that, that kind of wormhole of problems starts to open up. So, you know, on the surface side, I think what I've talked about is like the easy way. Mm-hmm. If it turns out that doesn't work, well, then you got to go and dig a bit deeper. Right, right. And a common issue I, I see with traders is they have problems honoring their system and their rules that they've laid out. And their their problem is they can identify maybe the, the best setup, their ideal setup, but they just can't execute. Uh, so I'd love to hear maybe the problem, you probably have, have run into this a bunch. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. So aside from any of the issues we've already talked about today, because yeah. all of them can be causes for that. Absolutely. Um, I would say that like poker players, traders mm-hmm. tend to be a bit more kind of uh, entrepreneurial, uh, more free-minded, more independent. Mm-hmm. And sometimes they're uh, rule breakers. They hate uh, conformity. They hate authority. And it sounds kind of strange, but what can happen for a lot of traders is that they start to rage against their own authority for their system. So there's this feeling like the I that knows best is the person that's here driving the trade in the moment, not the guy that like built the car and said, like, this is what's going to get you to your, your destination. It's like, no, no. I can drive it this way. And, and that feeling comes from the same part of you that, you know, wants, you know, infinite autonomy, infinite freedom, the ability to do what you want, when you want. And it's just sort of the wrong time to scratch that itch, right? We're, I'm not trying to get rid of that. I, mean, I think it's a, uh, it's a great feature for a lot of people to have. I mean, I, I, ha- I certainly have it myself. So what, what you have to understand is that there's a, there are different people that you can, uh, you know, kind of defy uh, authority towards. There's different people for whom, uh, you know, you can, uh, or th- there's different ways that you can uh, create freedom. It's like freedom comes through the system. Freedom comes through the execution. Um, in, in a way, I mean, just to give another analogy here, um, artists are people that tend to kind of hate constraints and hate, but, you know, an artist is constrained by their ability to use their tools, mm-hmm. right? Your ability to have kind of full creative expression is limited to how well you can, you know, use a paintbrush. And I've actually been listening to um, uh, the uh, Leonardo da Vinci audiobook, which is, you know, very cool. But I mean, this is a guy that was constantly like reinventing technique and yeah. coming up with new ways of of painting. And and so, without that technique, he couldn't allow his his the the creativity in his mind to come to its full fruition. For you as the trader to reach the levels of freedom and autonomy that you want, it comes through the execution of your system, through the the adherence to that, Mm -hmm. not by raging against it and trying to violate it and have infinite freedom at all times, in all places. Right, right. Uh, Perfect. Um, Jared, I'd love to hear kind of just, uh, I'm sure we've touched on so many concepts today, but um, just kind of general advice you would have for traders who want to get better at this aspect of trading, the the mental part of trading, the mindset, all of that, um, just to kind of start to wrap things up. Yeah, I guess what I would say is uh, that there's a lot of awareness in the industry. We know that psychology matters. We know that emotions impact results. Right. What, what, what is lacking, right, is the diligence and the work, right? And I'm, I'm not being denigrating to, you know, the steam bargers and, uh, you know, the, uh, like kind of his name now, you know, wrote trading in the zone, uh, Mark Douglas, Mark Douglas. Um, you know, of the world, like they, they pave the way for that awareness and that comprehension to be there. I know their books are in- incredibly helpful. My book offers a system. So I'm not trying to do what they did. They already mapped that part of trading psychology and they did a brilliant job of doing it. What I'm offering is a system and a structure and a process for you to do the work. If you don't do the work, you're gambling. 
right? And, and much like you would say to your traders, if you don't want to work the system, then you know, are you going to become like the mutual fund manager that can't beat the S and P? I mean, you're just guessing. And if you make money in the short term, is it because you're good or because you got lucky? We don't know. So the, the necessity is in doing the work. There's just no way. There's no way around it. And and you know, you should kind of want it that way because people tend to devalue things that come too easily. And so when you have to work for something and you work for your own mental and emotional progress, it feels different than if you just sort of have it already. And, you know, some traders do, they don't need the book, but the traders that are struggling, the traders that want to kind of maximize their potential and reach their potential, you got to do the work. There's just, there's, there is no other way. And when you're ready to do the work, you know, and you've read or you've already read, you know, Mark's book and, and Brett's book, you know, my book is, is going to kind of take you to that next level and, and provide you with a system, you know, to try to truly solve those problems. Perfect. And, um, Jared, um, I, I'd love to kind of, I, I guess, uh, I, w- I want to ask, like, uh, where's the best place for people who want to learn more about your system, your process? Obviously, I'll, I'll have links to your book, Twitter, website down below. Um, by the way, I really like your YouTube channel. I, I've watched a few of your office hours. I think they're really cool. Um, oh, that's but, awesome. Thank you. Yeah. But other than that, um, are there any great places for people to reach out to you if they, if they want to learn more uh, about your system? Yeah, I guess one thing I got is on the, on the website, there's a link towards resources. Um, and I've got a, a kind of a bunch of free stuff there. Um, I wrote an intuition ebook, mm-hmm. which is kind of a companion piece to the mental game of trading, um, you know, kind of pigeon uh, uh, dovetails on kind of things we talked about today. Um, there's also like kind of downloadable worksheets that you can use. Um, and, and I kind of keep kind of adding to that. So uh, certainly keep up there. Um, sign up for my newsletter. You know, I'm, I'm kind of getting better at, you know, kind of systematizing you know, my communications and writing blogs and writing, Mm -hmm. you know, kind of more material on a monthly basis. Um, So, you know, that's an important way to keep up with me, which is sort of on my website. But I would say between, you know, kind of Twitter, YouTube and and my website, you've kind of nailed the the top places for people to kind of interact with me. And 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 I do genuinely like answering questions. So whether it's on Twitter or whether it's in the office hours, you know, you've got a place to kind of reach out to me. And, you know, I enjoy that interaction because I often learn things and and that's, you know, kind of helpful for us both. Perfect. Um, yeah, I'll have those links down below in the description. Uh, Jared, thank you so much for taking the time. I really enjoyed this. I, I'm going to really enjoy watching it back a few times and really making sure I get those uh, concepts dialed in and, and also finishing your book, of course. I'm really enjoying that as well. Uh, so thanks so much again. And to everyone watching, I hope you enjoyed it as well. If you did, go ahead and leave a like down below and subscribe uh, if you haven't already to the Trailline channel. And we'll see you guys in future videos. Thanks.